The, the scientific analog of news is variance. Things don't get interesting until they vary. And one thing that's varied in recent years is the enthusiasm of those who enforce the laws regulating various aspects of, of the environment. It's a hard story to cover. You can zoom back and take a historical view, as Thomas Frank of the Wall Street Journal did in his well-written polemic, you get us drift from the title, The Wrecking Crew. Or you can do daily journalism to report all the twists and turns in agency policies. This strategy concentrates on process, and that's what I call source-based journalism. But readers are more interested in outcomes. What do citizens get when people who don't like regulation are in charge of the regulation? Finding out requires collecting data. I call this evidence-based journalism. And that's what two good reporters for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel did last year when they studied the work of two agencies concerned with dangerous chemicals in food and clothing, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration. Suzanne Rust in Milwaukee and Meg Kissinger in Washington covered the process by examining the close ties between the agencies and the companies they monitor. For the outcomes part, they got their newspaper to pay for independent laboratory studies to look for dangerous chemicals in consumer products, and they found them. So process and outcome, a nice balanced package, and a good example for their peers. So we're pleased to present this award of special merit to Meg Kissinger and Suzanne Rust. So we're going to do this in a two-parter tonight. I'm going to start off with sort of how we got into all of this, and Meg is going to come out um, with a really exciting part of this talk tonight, which was the fallout from <laughs> everything we've done. Um, oh, here's the clicker. So uh, for the past two years, we've been working on a series of stories that we've given the title Chemical Fallout to. Um, and we really have to give uh, most, oh, oh, even before I get here, I want to thank uh, the jurors. I wanted to thank the Metcalf Institute, um, the Grantham and Metcalf families for awarding with us. We're, we're quite honored. But I also want to thank George Stanley, who's our managing editor, and who um, gave us um, all the encouragement, the resources, um, and the motivation to do this. I've never seen anybody as excited about stories as he was, um, and we owe all of this to him. All right, so how did this all get started? Well, it started out um, with some poop and some monkeys and some hormones. Ten years ago, I was actually a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I studied monkeys. And what I did to pay my way through graduate school was um, actually look at feces, monkey feces. And I extracted hormones out of them. And what we were able to do was sort of correlate behavior um, and different estrogen, progesterone, testosterone levels. Um, and I thought, for some reason, this would be a really lucrative and interesting route to go down. So I took a class, oh wait, before I get there, called Hormones and Behavior. But I should have realized at that time I was a journalist and not a scientist because I had to run one of the um, seminars. As you may know, in graduate school, um, professors often do one lecture at the beginning of the semester and then they hand it over to the grad students to do the rest. But I best based my entire lecture on a New Yorker article. I actually didn't go to um, the scientific literature. I went to my favorite magazine. And I found this article called Silent Sperm. Um, it was a fascinating article. It uh, focused on a researcher in Denmark named Neil Skakebeck who had been looking at sperm uh, quantity and quality for several decades, and he had seen a precipitous drop in both the quality and quantity of sperm in Danish men. Um, and his sort of concluding hypothesis was that there were chemicals in the environment that men were being exposed to. It was upsetting their hormone levels and reducing the amount of sperm they had. At the same time, a book called Our Stolen Future came out, which did sort of the same thing, except it looked at wildlife. I was really fascinated in this research. Um, but things happened, and 10 years later, I found myself in the newsroom of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And that's supposed to be a time capsule. <laughs> I, I didn't actually go through space. Um, anyway, so I had been sort of following this um, just as an interested rep reporter. I would occasionally report on studies that came out about endocrine disruptors. But in 2007, in the spring, uh, the LA Times broke a story that the um, Environmental Working Group had been 
um, who gave them the, the tip on this, which showed that there was a panel um, with the Center for the Evaluation of Risks to Human Reproduction. It's a, it's a long panel name. Um, they were reviewing a chemical called bisphenol A. They gave, they contracted out the um, collection of papers and the writing of their draft report to a company that had clients that included BASF, Dow Chemical, DuPont, Chevron, et cetera, et cetera, all bisphenol A makers. So I wrote a story about this, and here we come back to my favorite guy, George Stanley, who said, this is really interesting. I think there might be a really good series of stories here on endocrine disruptors and government action. So he told me to go around the newsroom and pick out the people I wanted to work with on this. So first I went to Meg Kissinger, who is the most phenomenal reporter on the planet, um, and a ton of fun to work with. Um, I actually didn't know she was a ton of fun to work with at the time, but I kind of figured it out, um, and we've had a blast. I also um, looked at Kerry Spiever, well, didn't look at him. I asked him to join <laughs> us as well. Um, he's a business investigative reporter. Um, I'm not real business savvy. I was a scientist again, um, and so called him on to help us with us some stuff, excuse me. And Mark Hatches, who was a new investigative editor at our paper. Uh, first thing we did was we decided to see what the government was doing about endocrine disruptors, went to their own website, which showed us that they hadn't done much of anything. So in 1996, they decided they'd look into this and start controlling them. By 2007, they'd had four iterations of a panel, but still hadn't done anything, um, hadn't reviewed any single one of the chemicals they were supposed to. We did a really broad sort of look at government panels that were looking at this, government agencies that were looking at this, but we decided we'd also hyper-focus on this chemical that I already mentioned, bisphenol A. Well, oops. Anyway, uh, oh, which uh, you find in baby bottles and which babies drink. I don't know why I had to show you that picture. That's pretty um, self-explanatory that babies drink out of baby bottles. But you also find it in a ton of other things. It's probably in this. It's in eyeglasses. It's in protective gear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I went to the original scientific literature, pulled 258 studies that looked at the effect of this chemical on animals with spines in laboratories. Um, might sound a little arbitrary, but it actually wasn't. Um, and we found that 80% of academic and government studies found that this chemical was dangerous. Nine out of 10 industry-funded studies showed that there was no harm. Um, uh, okay, so I got a little confused here. So nine out of 10 industry studies showed there were no harm. We were, what we were able eventually to show was that most of these there, the, most of the studies showed that there was harm in this chemical. Um, I'm sort of not gonna give you, uh, we spent another year working on this chemical, on other programs, how, um, looking at how the government was being influenced um, by industry. Um, oh. Um, and in the fall of 2008, this is sort of another, another big one, the FDA decided to take a look at the chemical, um, and they, based, they, they, they ended up saying it was safe, but they basically um, based their whole analysis on two industry-funded studies. Um, they also decided that they would get a uh, subcommittee to come and look at their analysis because there had been a lot of fallout. They wanted a peer review of it. Um, and Meg will get into, into the, sort of the exciting part about that, but, it, but essentially, should I go into this? Yeah. Essentially, they called together this panel. Um, the head of the panel was a man named Martin Filbert, who is a toxicologist at the University of Michigan. He works for the Center for uh, risk, risk Assessment. The Center for Risk Assessment had just received a $5 million grant, which is more than they ever get, um, from a man who was a big anti-regulationist um, who was considered the second worst polluter in, in Michigan um, and who had told Filbert that he thought bisphenol A was safe. So I'm going to leave that at that and Meg's going to do the more exciting part of this.